Hi everyone, Dom Famularo here, and I am back here for the Saving Education Network that I do every uh, every other Thursday, and it's just so great to have this opportunity to bring certain people in to discuss not only what their playing abilities are at, which of course is something which we want to hear about, and their career and what they have done and what they are doing, but also some of the personal challenges that they have, that they've gone through, especially with this pandemic. We all have been challenged, we all have been tested. But this next person that I have here, which is just a fantastic old friend of mine for many, many years, a phenomenal player. I mean, he plays so deep at what he does. And we're going to talk about his book, too, African American Funk, published by Monodrama Publications. We're going to get into that also. So would you all please welcome the great, absolutely, Jonathan Joseph has entered the room. Woo! What's going on? Good to see you, Dom. Good to see you. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming by. You know, we have this spot here with the Sabian Education Network, and I get a chance to talk to people all around the world and having some time with yourself too, talking about what you've been doing, the great artists that you have worked with in your career. These are legendary artists that you've had the chance to work with and you continue to work with. And also, as I said, I want to get into your book at some point and talk about that too, because that and what you put together with Steve Rucker is absolutely fantastic. I use this with my students and they love it. Oh, excellent, excellent, yes. So let's, let's go back a little bit if we can. Let's go back just to the, the beginning stages of, of when you started with drumming. I mean, you, where you were born, what, you, how'd that all kind of enter your life? Okay, uh, I, I started when, I guess the, 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 the moment that I actually started was, was when uh, I went to church, I think I was five years old, and uh, it, was, it was a gospel musical. And I saw, I was sitting in the back of the church, five years old, Tommy Day, that was the, that was the drummer's name, was playing an orange sparkle drum set at this gospel concert. And that, that was the moment I, I was just kind of transfixed the entire you know, service. And then after, after they finished, I walked up on the pulpit and he had broken a stick and I picked up the stick and I took it home to my mom. And uh, you know, I, I started begging my mom for a drum set. <laughs> and then uh, I, on, a year later for Christmas, I woke up and there was a, a Ludwig standard snare was under the Christmas tree uh, when I was six years old. So that's how it started. Yeah. <laughs> started the process. So, so did you get involved with, with playing in any of the church music? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so my family was basically res responsible for the music in our church. It's the uh, Church of God in Christ. It's a Pentecostal uh, church. So and within that particular denomination, music is big time like 80 percent of the service yeah 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 so that that was kind of like where i grew up and um you know was running with you know all of my friends in the church at that at that time and those kind of like formative years learning trying to you know trying to play the drums but you know i, I tell you then when i was you know eight nine years old my they would throw me off the drums like in the middle of the song <laughs> But I was determined. <laughs> I was determined not to be defeated. <laughs> well, that, that, that is a, a very important quality that you showcase because you are just nonstop in what you're doing with many of the challenges that have been thrown at you. So yeah. with any drummers that you were listening to as you kind of got a little older, with 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 was there music you were starting to listen to? Well, yes. I mean, so I, I played in church, you know, for, for those years. Uh, and then as... Uh, I think when I was 14 years old, um, my brother came home uh, with a, you know, back in those days, he used to have a big boom box that they carry on the shoulder, you know. My brother came home and he was like playing this like really loud music that I had never heard anything like that before. And I remember standing on the, the stairs uh, at, at the house. And when he walked up, I said, who is that? And he said, he looks at me and he says, Man, that's that's Jeff Beck wired, <laughs> and I and I and I stood there listening, and the song that was playing was Sophie. Oh, know, you know, with Narada on on drums, you oh, know, man. Narada Michael Walden. You know, he wrote that track, and he and uh, you know he was playing on that track, and I I just stood there, just kind of like transfixed, and from that moment on, you know, I was kind of like in search of improvisational music. Boy, that what. Narada, man, what a phenomenal player he is and always Absolutely. has been. Absolutely. So improvisational music, that, that kind of struck you as far as that, that kind of creative, you know, think on your feet and play yes. with feel kind of music. Yes. I mean, which I mean, which you kind of do in church anyway, 
But the context was, you know, completely different. Obviously, you know, with particularly with Jeff, you know, it's kind of like more of a, you know, rock fusion, jazz rock fusion, you know, yeah. between Blow by Blow, Wired, and There and Back, you know, particularly. Those albums, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> Jeff has always surrounded himself with great drummers. Yes, yes. And, and you know, I feel very fortunate to be, uh, to, to have sat in that chair. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So, what, I mean, this, this, this has got to be a, an incredible, you know, this, this is a dream at a high level. Here you are, you're influenced by hearing Jeff Beck's playing, and then years later you get a chance to sit behind him, and while you're playing, you're hearing that guitar sound, that famous guitar sound. What was that like? It was just unbelievable. And, uh, you know, the way that that came about, I was, I was taking uh, my, my, my stepdaughter at the time, I was taking her to the airport, Josh Stone, and uh, we, this was in England, and we were riding past Bristol, and we were talking about something, and I just kind of made an off-the-cuff remark saying, uh, listen, if you ever speak with Jeff, tell him I'd love to audition for his band, and in the event Vinny can't make it, you know, Vin, Vinny Galeuta, you know, yeah. that's, that's how it happens. So she picked up the phone, like, right then and called Jeff, and they got into a conversation and I'm there, you know, I'm driving towards Heathrow. And then the next thing I know, she just kind of pops out with, hey, listen, I know this great drummer who wants to audition for your band in case Vinny can't make it. Oh and, and, and at that time we owned a live music venue uh, down in, in Exeter, in Exeter, England. It was called Mama Stones. And she basically invited Jeff to come down to the club to do a gig. <laughs> and he came. And he, you know, he came with his with his lovely wife Sandra, and you know, this was in I think December of of 2012, uh, and there there he was sitting at my breakfast table, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, just surreal, really. And 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 of all the people that I've worked with, and you know, uh, my connection to to improvisation started with Jeff. It never occurred to me that he would, I would, you know, be in his band. <laughs> you know, it was just, you know, it was just so, so far away. It just never really, I mean, I, because when I made the comment to Joss, it was completely random and, and like a throwaway thing, almost like a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but no, there, and so, you know, I, the next day, you know, the, a few months later, I'm sitting there and he, there he is sitting at my breakfast table, you know, with his computer. And uh, we did that. We did that show at Mama Stones. We had a twelve-hour rehearsal, and uh, the gig went really well. The next morning, you know, he's sitting there at the table with his computer, and he's telling me about this new band that he wants to put together, and he wants me to play drums. So that's how it happened. Well, this is this is so great. What what happens at a twelve-hour rehearsal? Oh, well, it's very intense. I mean, you know, Jeff, and, and it's not just Jeff. You know, all of the guys that I've worked with, Pat Metheny, Joe Zivinol, you know, Richard Bonin, all of these guys have what I'll describe as unique energy. And that uh, the pace uh, and, and the amount of energy they're able to sustain for long periods of time is extreme. Now, none of these guys actually play drums. So, as you know, the drum set is an extremely physical instrument. Time, yeah. So, you know, sitting on a drum seat for 12 hours is a bit different than, you know, sitting behind a keyboard or, or playing a guitar or playing a bass, you know? So the, the, the demands, I think the demands on the drummer, I mean, it's just no question in my mind, physically, the drums are the most demanding instrument, you know, of, of all the kind of like modern instrument, instruments in modern music. Yeah. Um, you know, so to so to maintain that pace, you know, like twelve hours a day, and you know the the soreness in the in the arms of the shoulders, that you know just everything, especially when you're playing, you know, kind of like rock fusion, which is very loud yeah. and very intense. Yeah, yeah, all the time, the whole all the time, the, yeah, the whole tune, the whole each song and throughout the show, it's intense. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, you know, you got to, you got to, you know, you, you really have to live like a certain way to be able to maintain that as you get older. It's much easier when you're younger, you know, it's not really that much of a problem when you're younger, but as you begin to age, you know, it's a, it's a butt kicker, you know. <laughs> so let's, let's go back now. So, so you, you're hearing, you, you first hear, you know, the, the album Wired, you, you're like, you know, it's, it's opening your mind. Mm -hmm. but then, 
did you start taking lessons? How were you learning the instrument? Well, I, I didn't start taking lessons until many years later with Steve Rucker, yeah. uh, you know, the co-author of, of the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that can I think I started with Steve when I was 16 or 17. Um, and in, in the interim, from the time that I was introduced to Narada, uh, I went to Buffalo. I had a cousin up in Buffalo, New York. Um, he's, he's passed away now, but Alan Jackson, he turned me on to, to Billy Cobham. I was in his, I was in, he was, he was a drummer also. And I was in his apartment when he introduced me to Spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like Billy Cobham always does. It's a mind expanding experience that just, yeah. just a, an aha moment. Yeah, it really is fantastic. Exactly. So in that moment, you know, I'm listening to Spectrum and I'm listening to Billy in those roles and I'm thinking, how can this, how can this be possible? You know, um, and, and I decided in that moment, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I've got to get my roles to sound like that. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm still trying to get my roles to sign. <laughs> yeah. And what I've, an inspiration. Yeah. I've known Billy for 50 years, man. It's incredible. You know, he, I mean, he, he is, he's still an inspiration. He is, you know, 76 years young, still playing great, lives in Switzerland. I talk to Billy all the time, you know, once a week. We're doing some master classes together. Right. And never ceases to amaze me of his energy, his discipline, his musicality, his compositional skills. I mean, this is one one special person yeah absolutely i've had I ha i've had the pleasure of meeting him on several occasions and uh you know he's always a gentleman and of course i mean he's billy Cobham. he's and he you know he plays you know i can't say enough tremendous things about his playing uh, other than you know i would love to have an opportunity to do some you know some type of drum duo thing with him I mean, that, for, for me, that would be an honor, you know, an honor to cherish. You know. Well, you put the call out again. When I speak to him in a couple of days, I'm going to mention that to him for sure. So absolutely, uh, I'm going to put that into the into the system. OK, so you, you're, you're 16 years old. You start studying with Steve and Steve Rucker, who was a phenomenal player with the Bee Gees all the years that he did. His, his educational you know, knowledge is endless, endless. Yes. So we, we, were you studying with Steve privately or was this at, at my, in Miami University? Well, I started with Steve when I was in high school. Uh, so I started with him when I was in 11th grade. And I mean, for me, Steve was just the quintessential teacher. You know, he's, he's just, as you said, he's a plethora of knowledge and his ability to communicate in particular, his communication style really resonated with me. So I was able, you know, the three years, I, I, so I, I started with him in 11th grade, and then I attended the University of Miami briefly. Uh, I think this was back in 1985 or so. Um, and, you know, it's funny because after spending two years studying with him privately, I went to the school and I was telling him, I remember sitting out, you know, in the courtyard telling him, man, you know, I, I really think that I need to go to New York and, you know, try and, you know, make make a name for myself there. And he said, yeah, I think you should. I think you should leave here, you know, <laughs> drop out of school and, and, head, and head for, you know, in New York. That's how real Steve Rucker is. Yeah, Steve is, Steve calls it like it is, man. And, but, you know, I got to tell you something, I've done it many years. He's always right. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people, if he says it, just do it. Yes. So you yeah. did. So you made the move to come to New York. Well, I, well, it was a few years later that I actually made it up to New York, but I did make it. Um, so now we're we're kind of skipping ahead to 1995 or so. Um, yeah, I went I went to New York and and did really really well in New York. But there's there's a couple of things that happened before I got to New York. One yeah, of when did Betty Wright happen? Was that one of the first tours that you did? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, Betty Wright, uh, I started working with Betty, I think it was 1989. Okay, yeah. It was, uh, she had an album out called Passion and Compassion. And uh, yeah, she, she came out. I was, I was w uh, working at a, a club on, on South Beach called The Tropics. And she and her producer, Angelo Morris, who's one of my closest friends now, uh, came out to hear me play. I was, I was recommended by a couple of the guys in, in her band. And uh, she came out to the gig to hear me play. The next thing I know, I'm in her band. 
and I'm and uh, this is like 89, 90. Um, and, and this is like my first real road gig, like on a tour bus, you know? And, uh, we, you know, we would go out, you know, th uh, on the weekends, kind of like Thursday to Sunday, you know, between two to four, four times a month, you know? And that was kind of happening regularly, like on the cycle. And we were doing the Chitlin circuit. Jesus, that's fantastic. So yeah. the experience that you're getting and playing is just now as deep as you can imagine. So. In those days before you hit off with with, with Betty Wright, were you were you jamming with musicians? Were you meeting players? Were you getting together? And was it was a local playing happening? I was I was kind of working my way around the local scene. Uh, but one of the uh, big inf influences that I had in Miami, because you know, obviously South Florida is the home of Jaco Pistorius, yeah, yeah. and and I don't I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Bobby Thomas. Bobby. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Thomas um, is the he's the hand drummer on the Weather Report album Night Passage. That's interesting. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Which is which is my favorite Weather Report album. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I was I was introduced to Bobby and Bobby kind of took me under his wing and invited me over to his house. Uh, and I and there in South Miami <clears throat> and I went there and, and started hanging out with him. And that was my time I spent with Bobby was like really, really pivotal because as a hand drummer, I had never really seen any, you know, because back in these days, there were no videos. Yeah. You know, this is, this, this is way before YouTube. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd never really seen anyone execute the rudiments on a drum set uh, or, or on congas and percussion instruments, you know, the way that he did it, you know, so watching him, you know, manipulate paradiddles and double paradiddles and flam taps and you know these things yeah. on the, on the congas and and having just like be able to sit and watch that for me was like a really mind blowing experience, yeah. and I realized that if I adapted some of these you know ideas and techniques, it would help me achieve this Billy Cobb and Roll sound that I was going. <laughs> so. Uh, Bobby, you know, uh, big shout out to Bobby and, and Bobby gets a lot of credit and I thank him, you know, for, for taking the time with me because I was, I might have been, you know, 18 or 19 at that time. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. So you're getting some 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 deep experience. You're, 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 you're hearing some great players. You're playing with some great players. Now you're traveling with Betty. You're doing the, you're, you're doing the traveling scene. What were you listening to and learning around that time? Were you, were you still, you know, actively trying to seek out new music? Well, yes. I mean, you know, during during that time, you know, Weather Report was the was the was the band. Yeah, that, that was it. it. And uh, you know, being from Florida, Weather Report, you know, and Jocko was that was that was what was happening. You know, so there were a number of people in South Florida. Randy Burnson was one of them, the, the guitarist. Um, you know, that were that were really kind of like in, influential in terms of me working locally mm -hmm. and being able to. Uh, learn to understand the weather report concept, you know, and how that works with the ride symbol. Right, right, right. How, you know, adapt, adapting you know, the spangling pattern from the ride symbol into that modern fusion, you know, kind of approach. Yeah. And um, so uh, I also, uh, while I was working with Betty, I, I was also work, working with Othello Molino, the steel pan player. Right, 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 right. Right, and I think it was 1991 we did a, an album. I did an album with him, uh, which was his first and only solo project called in, uh, uh, It's About Time. And I mean, that's a, that's a brilliant record, some uh, brilliant writing and, and uh, some great playing, you know, with some, some great musicians. But that's, that's what I was doing. So I was on the R&B circuit in the early 90s with Betty. And then I was on kind of like the jazz fusion circuit with Othello, you know, playing, you know, this weather report esque, you know, <laughs> kind of kind of music. Yeah. So you're really kind of stepping into this this <coughs> improvisational music. I mean, you're really kind of stepping into the world of listen, Zawinul and, and and Weather Report. Well, that that was like really creative, you know, Erskine and Alex Acuna. I mean, there, there was you know, Jocko, there was like so much energy in the creative process at that time. So you were kind of getting sucked into that right in the middle of it. Yeah, that was that was kind of my intention. That's kind of the place where I wanted to be. You know, when um, I decided when I was in high school 
that I wanted to be a musician, you know, professionally. And I, you know, I was kind of thinking, I was actually reading through Modern Drummer uh, while I was in band class and uh, Steve Gadd was on the cover of this particular issue and I was reading, you know, his, his interview and everything. And I decided in that moment, okay, I think, I think I'm gonna go after, you know, being a musician and I guess maybe I can go to music school and, and you know, study music there and man, you know, I don't, I don't have to be the best drummer in the world, but I, I want to be named amongst those that are. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was my goal, you know. So uh, that, that's what I decided sitting in that chair in, in, in marching band. And uh, that's, you know, that's what I pursued. So, you know, I was, I was kind of always kind of uh, targeting the, the individuals that I thought were at the, you know, at the top of, of their games. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk about the power of intention. I mean, because you said it was your intention. It's almost like you put that out in the universe. That that's where you wanted to go. Yes, absolutely. Just talk I mean, about that, that kind of commitment. Well, you know, different people nowadays, they do different things. They have like a vision board, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I didn't have a physical vision board, but I certainly had a mental one of what I wanted to do. And I wanted to be on tour playing with the greatest musical minds of the modern era. That was, that was, you know, what I set out to do. And I think when you're dedicated, when you dedicate your life and you focus and you harness all of your, your energy, you know, to move in that, that direction and you don't allow yourself to get sidetracked by the nonsense. Right on. You know, because, you know, there are forces that come to 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 take you off course. Yeah. And, you know, they they present themselves in, in very luxurious ways. But really, its purpose is to is to sabotage your your intent well, to, to be to be tested. We're being tested and challenged. Absolutely. You know, so it, it, it is it is imperative that one has the the intestinal fortitude and the commitment with the higher power to stay on the to stay on track you know basically so where do you think that comes from where, where does that that discipline or that that it's like a tool that you have how do you develop that tool how do you develop that skill well I, I think for me it was it was actually innate you know because I loved drumming like like I'm sure everyone who is a drummer who's listening to this, loves the instrument yeah. and and uh you know really playing it's healing for my soul you know i feel better after i play yeah. <clears throat> you know it's a it's a it's a therapy and i think that the the focused energy that that goes into those years of practicing every day hour after hour week after week you know you know all of that <clears throat> it's it sets up a spirit you know, within you, yeah. and and when you get out of that flow, at least for me, if I got out of the flow, you know, nothing in life was right. <laughs> you know, so it, it was a matter of staying. You know, uh, having focused my mind to achieve a goal, and believing that I would be at the right place at the right time to meet the right people to help me go to the next step or, or, or go to the next level. Right, you know, right. This is exactly what happened, you know, in the course of my career in the early 90s. Uh, because basically uh, from from my work with Othello, from having done that album with him, yeah. we went to New York to play at this place, which is no longer there, called Zanzibar. But um, the, the owner of the record label, which I think was Big World Records, uh, and I can't remember his name, but he put on a Jocko Pistorius. Uh, I think it was a, a, a Jocko a birthday celebration uh, at this club Zanzibar in New York. So every basically everybody who was anybody was at this gig, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it was, this was just a few years after Jocko had passed. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, we played there and I was just kind of like noticed. And, and discovered by one person who was extremely influential in my career was, was Gil Goldstein. Wow. The, the arranger slash producer slash yeah. keyboardist, also with Billy Cobham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Many years with Billy, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was seen by the right people 
at, at that gig, basically. And then a few months after that, because Bobby Thomas was actually on that gig because he did that album with Othello. A few months after having done that gig, I got a call to join the Zyvano Syndicate. Well, what was, first of all, what were the rehearsals like when you first joined the band? What was that like? We rehearsed, I was, I rehearsed with Gerald Beasley, the bass player, and Amit Chatterjee, the guitar player, in a little dinky rehearsal studio somewhere in, in uh, Washington Square. It was close to Washington Square and, you know, in, in Manhattan. Joe was nowhere to be seen, <laughs> you know, and I think I had three days in, in that little rehearsal studio, you know, playing, playing this just mind blowing music. I mean, it was just mind blowing, you know. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I, uh, that was the rehearsal, uh, the, those rehearsals. And then my first show with the syndicate was in Elat, Israel for the Red Sea Jazz Festival. That so was my, that was my, my uh, maiden voyage with the Zavano Syndicate. Think of this intensity, you know, you're rehearsing, you know, you know <laughs> intensely with these guys, and then you're hopping on a plane going to Israel and, and, and the insanity continues. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go, this is the story of my life. <laughs> Insanity. <laughs> so you, I mean, you have got on. I mean, the, the, the list of people, and I only have a partial list here. I mean, you know, going back from, you know, Alexander O'Neill to Al Jarreau, Mike Stern, you know, Beverly Knight, Bill Evans, David Sanborn, Jeff Beck, you know, Zawinul, Josh Stone. I mean, her, you, you were on her, 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 the Soul Sessions tour. Yes, yes, Josh. Um, so I, 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 Josh came much later um, in in the. In the sequence, do you want to jump to her now, or, or? let's let's go down to the sequence then? Let's go down to the okay. sequence. So how, yeah. how, how did all that happen? So so after uh, this is I think 1993 um, I, when I joined the Zavinov Syndicate. Yeah. And off the back of that, I had a trio that was playing on on Miami Beach on South Beach uh, uh, with with the, a couple of guys that were on Othello's album. And lo and behold, Pat Metheny was sitting at the back of the club, of this club on South Beach, listening to my trio. Incredible. I had no idea he was there. Hmm. He sat there through the entire first set. We finished the first set. I went to, to go get a drink or something. And the keyboard player, Abel Pabon, he walks up to me and he's got this like weird smile on his face. <laughs> he says, Jonathan. You're not going to believe this, but Pat Metheny is sitting in the back over there and he wants to talk to you. <laughs> so that that was, you know, here we go again, you know, with another absolutely surreal moment. So I go over and there's Pat and I meet Pat, you know, and to make a long story short, Pat invites me over to his house. He was working on the We Live Here album, which he I think, wrote and recorded in in his, I believe in his home and uh, the home that I think he was just renting a place, I think on Star Island or something. But anyway, I went over there and I played, it was just the two of us, just guitar and drums. And that led to me substituting for Paul Wordico in the Pat Metheny group in 1995 in Asia. So that's, that's, how I met Pat and, uh, you know, I'm still in contact with him, you know, to this day. Um, and, you know, again, so that was another kind of like surreal experience because obviously the music of the Pat Metheny group is nothing like the music of Joe Zavino. Totally, totally. Or Betty Wright, <laughs> you know. Uh, so that was 1995 and that's when uh, from that time, I I, um, I I started moving. You know, uh, actually, I actually made it to New York. I was kind of living between uh, uh, in, out in Queens, and some. I spent some time in New Jersey, but but during that time, um, I uh, I had met Gil a few years before at that Jocko uh, birthday bash, yeah. and Gil kind of took me under his wing, and he had so much stuff going on with everybody that mattered, yeah. you know. And uh, I was kind of like his first call for the different things that he was doing. So that included 
David Sanborn. Um, I was, uh, David did an album called Pearls, which he recorded with, with strings, basically. And we had a, a, like a jazz trio that was set up with the 70 piece orchestra, you know, playing the music of, you know, Jerome Kern, you know, for, for example, it's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I started working with, with Sanborn, uh, you know, off of my relationship with, 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 uh, Gil that also led to doing a similar gig with Al Jarreau with, uh, you know, with strings also. Yeah. And I also did, uh, a, I met Randy Brecker from well, where, where Gil was, was uh, producing Randy's album, Into the Sun. This is 1997 now. Uh, Into the Sun ended up winning a Grammy. Yeah, absolutely. So that was my first Grammy award. Uh, you know, being being on that record, so that's a you know, it's got to be a high that it's like, it's like you know, who you're playing with, what you're winning, the kind of music you're playing. I mean, this is real high quality stuff. Yeah, yeah, this is this is exactly what I wanted. You know, it's all where I wanted to be, and it was all the '90s. That was a good decade for me, really. Uh, it was all kind of moving the way that that I wanted it to move. Um, you know, so. Uh, in in nine in ninety seven, you know, following the the in, into the sun uh, uh, show uh, that that gig, the Yellow Jackets. Uh, Will Kennedy left the Yellow Jackets, hmm. and they were the band. They were looking, you know, for a replacement for Will Kennedy. And Terry Lynn Carrington was doing gigs. I was doing gigs, and. Um, uh, the guy who actually ended up with the gig, which I, I beg your pardon, I can't think of his name. Uh, but but anyway, um, I did a few gigs with the Yellow Jackets. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a part of their kind of like audition search, uh, so that was that was that was great because I had a great relationship with Jimmy Haslip. You know, we get, we got on very well. Jimmy's a great player. Yeah, yes, he is, and a great guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so a after that, I I eventually met Richard Bona. Now, Richard is kind of like a pivotal point in my career because, and this was either 90, I think it was around 98 that I met Richard. And this was before Richard kind of like became Richard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he had just moved to uh, to New York from France. And I met him at a, at a club and and a few months later, he started his his own band. And um, uh, this, I guess this is like 1998 at, at this point. And I became a member of Richard's band. And of course, Richard, Richard is, you know, he's just, he's like breathing different air. Yeah, from, yeah, yeah totally. totally. <laughs> you know, and I was introduced to the material that is now in my book that, 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 you're, that you held up there. That's... That that, uh, yes, exercises in African American funk is basically an exercise book of the rhythms that I use and the techniques and the patterns that I use to teach myself to play the rhythms that Richard taught me. Well, this is this is incredible. One, I think uh, someone from Sabine said, "Was it Marcus uh, Baylor who was the drummer that?" Yes, yes, Marcus Bailey. Yes, with the Yellow Jackets. Yes, right. there, there it is. That, 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 that's somebody from Sabian. It's probably Chris Stanky or someone that probably. Came yes, <laughs> that's that's the knowledge of Christian Stanky, who's the. Shout out, to Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. So, so with this, so let's talk about the book now. So, you put the book together, and and you connect with Steve back again with the book and these ideas. Well, so so what happened before I put the book together was I, as a member of Richard's band. How, am I taking too long? Or how are we doing? Go, 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 keep going, keep going. Okay, um, as a as a member of Richard's band, you know the the Bakutsi and Mangambe rhythms. He would he would sing these rhythms to me, and I couldn't really understand, you know, <laughs> what he was talking about, you know, because. My knowledge of of you know six eight what I what I'll call six eight you know because that's the way Americans think you know yeah. when it comes to kind of it was like Afro Cuban six eight that 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 was that was kind of like my knowledge of Afro 
Cuban you know, rhythms. Yeah. However, what Richard was talking about didn't really have anything to do with that, 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 <laughs> you know, which is, is also, you know, you can kind of call that rumba clave. Right. Or, or the avaqua. Interesting. Right. Um, so this manganbe rhythm, which basically deals with the second partial of the triplet, you know, counting and four four. That second partial of the trip, trip triplet, when you accent that, it sounds like it's the first partial of the triplet. That's the first thing. Right. So it becomes very confusing and it's very easy to get lost <laughs> if you don't understand the nature of and the feel of this rhythm and how it how it works. Yeah. So it took me a while and basically what I would do, um, I was kind of commuting back and forth between Florida and New York because flights during that time were really cheap on JetBlue. Yeah. And I had a family in, in Miami, you know, I was married and, I, and my son was there and uh, I was flying up to New York to, you know, to play with Richard, you know, uh, like every other week. And he would kind of like teach me like a new rhythm. And then I'd fly back to Miami and then like two weeks, I'd be like in the woodshed, like, you know, try, trying to get that together. And then I'd fly back up to New York and then I'd be like, <laughs> 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 yeah. So, you know, that went on, that went on for a while. Um, and, and during that time also, this is, this is like uh, 1998, 1999. I was, I, while I was working with, Richard, Arturo Ortiz came in to listen to one of the shows that we did. Arturo was the musical director for Ricky Martin. Mm -hmm. Arturo sounded me after one of the concerts with Richard asking me if I would be interested in working with Ricky Martin. Yeah. Now this is, this is uh, 1998, just before Living La Vida Loca came out. Okay. So, I was in the band when Living La Vida Loca came out. And I was now Living La Vida Loca. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. So I left, I left Richard to, to go live La Vida Loca for about eight, eight months. And then I left Ricky because I was just fed up. There were, there were many things about that gig that were unattractive. Hmm. Uh, and the money wasn't very good. Actually, Richard's gig paid better. And, and it was better music. So I, so I left, <laughs> left Ricky and I went back to Richard and I got back, you know, on Richard's gig. And he's like, so you're telling me that you're not playing with Ricky Martin anymore? And I said, no, man. You know, I, I, left, I left him. And he didn't actually believe me until he saw a concert with Ricky on TV with a different drum. <laughs> you, know, you know, because... I mean, Rick, you know, living La Vida Loca was like the biggest thing on the planet. But I basically walked out in the middle of that because it, that's it wasn't the biggest thing for me. Yeah, yeah, and that this, that happens in the music industry. You know, business deals and situations. You know, they all change. They're all different for everybody. Mm -hmm. So now you're going. Now you're back in the New York area. Yep, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm back I'm back on the gig with uh, with Richard. So now this is uh, around 2000 2001 or so, right. uh, and I'm continuing you know to to work do that work. And then in 2003, this is where Joss comes in. Uh, I met Joss uh, in the summer of 03, and I was introduced to Joss by Betty Wright. Hmm. So by this time, you know, I, I've known Betty for many years. You know, Betty passed away yeah. uh, la last year. Yeah, but uh, Betty, over the years, Betty and I became very close friends. And uh, she recommended me to be the musical director for, for Joss. And at the time, Joss was, I think, 15 years old when I met her in 03. And, you know, she was supremely talented, but had no experience in working with a band. Or you know, or, or performing live, but she had made this this you know phenomenal record called Soul Sessions, yeah. and the the uh, the label Steve Greenberg, uh, the owner of the label, they you know decided to put a band together for her so that she could get some experience and 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 to con and and continue to develop. So that's how I met Joss. It was at a uh, rehearsal studio in in North Miami Beach. <laughs> well, that's incredible. So so the the first tour was the Soul Session tour. Right, right. But, you know, before that tour, 
we were just doing kind of like one-offs so that she could get used to being on a stage. Yeah, and, and develop her skills. Absolutely, it's so smart. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah, yeah. So, so we did that, and then uh, you know, her career obviously just just blew up. Um, kind of like starting around October of two thousand three, and then um, that continued. I, I continued as her musical director. I think it was until about March of two thousand four, at which time I left the band to and moved to to England to marry her mom. Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> How powerful yeah. is that, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so I, I lived, that's how I got to England, basically. So I, I then lived in England, you know, for, for many years. Um, it was about eight or nine years before I came back to America. And then I was kind of like traveling back and forth between America and and uh, and England and when, uh, and we had uh, Mama Stones, uh, the, the club where I met met Jeff. Yeah. But before I met Jeff and we were running this club, I wasn't really doing much touring at that time. That's when I put the book together. Interesting, interesting. Well, yeah, you were, you were in England at that time, right? And um, I I contacted Steve, you know, because I'd never written a book. Yeah. I just had, you know, I had like all these notes um, and patterns, uh, you know, that I had written out. And, and I was I remember I was, on, I was on a flight flying somewhere and I was just trying to think, OK, where do I start? You know, what's the how should I do this? And I ended up giving Steve a call because he would be the guy who, who yeah. would know, you, you know, Very smart. So, I, yeah, I, I told him what I was, you know, trying to do. And uh, and he just immediately said yes and, <laughs> and kind of jumped on board and, and just helped me write that book basically, you know? And uh, I mean, he, he, I couldn't have done it without him for sure. You know? Well, the, the, the book, the book is, is laid out so beautifully well. And, and, you know, you talk about halftime shuffle of funks and stuff like that, and, but the book is written, which I think is smart is it's all in triplet form. Yes. And four, four. In four, four triplet, which many times implies that six eight feel in what it is. So, but I mean, from a reading standpoint, it's so easy to read and it makes so much sense that it allows us to learn certain rhythms that if we were to see it in six eight or see it in a certain way, we, we probably would have a wall of learning. Exactly. It breaks down the freaking wall. Ex exactly. So it's that was done intentionally, but the first reason it's written in four four is because that's the way Africans feel it. Africans don't feel that those rhythms in six; they feel it in four. So this is this is kind of like the key because what happens also when you're counting in four, there's more space between the notes than when you're counting in six. Right. And that space is needed to manipulate the placement of the note from beat to beat because they don't always it moves these rhythms they move in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Even if you if you put them on the grid, they're not meant to be quantized, you know, like at 90 or 100 percent. If you do that, you'll destroy the rhythm. You know, it's moving. It's ebbing and flowing in a certain fashion. Boy, it, it really is beautiful. And I want everyone to kind of like I want to hold the book up again. Everyone should go out, pick up this book. It really is clear in how. It makes you think differently. It offers different grooves to play. It opens up your mind in that three feel, that triplet. Even though it's in four four, it's got like a three feel to it. Mm -hmm. All these different things. and the mangambi and the bikutsuzi and the shuffle. It's all a part of this this rhythms that you laid out. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, it's it's when you think about mangambi. I mean, I realized at at some point in during my analysis of trying to figure out how to play mangambi. <laughs> It's the Mangambe rhythm is the shuffle. It's like the American shuffle yeah. ride symbol pattern yeah, yeah. displaced forward by an eighth note. Yeah. That's a, that's effectively what it is. So it's it's basically it's it's the the um it's almost like the first two parts of a triplet. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. Yes. That part of it, which almost comes down to like a a, a, a Swiss triplet feel. Right. That, that kind of a feel. 
Yeah, so that's a, that's a that's a very good analogy because with the Swiss triplet, when you think about it like that, you automatically accent the second partial on on the right. on the front. Right, 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 right. Well, that's, 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 yeah. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Boy, this really is well done. So again, I want everyone to go out and pick up the book in its form, Modern Term of Publications. You can track it down, Jonathan Joseph. But let's just talk about it if you can while we have a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Sabian symbols. What what sounds do you use? What 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 kind of brought you into Sabian of the world of these fantastic symbols that are being made? I, I got I got connected with Sabian when I was 17 or 18 years old. <clears throat> and uh I think uh, one of the early on, I, I worked with a, a Latin jazz flautist. His name was Nestor Torres, mm -hmm. and a, a friend of mine was working with with Nestor before I I started playing with him. But he was playing Sabian cymbals, and and during during that time, if, if you guys can, yeah, sure, the AAX man, beautiful. Yeah, I was introduced to you know to the. I, I think at that time it was. This was before the AAX, I think, actually came out. <laughs> so, but, they, I, but I think they had the AAs at, at that time. You're right. Uh, and, and, and my first Sabian symbol was a 16-inch AA crash. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I started, I, geez, I can't remember. I, I can't remember the first person I was in contact with that Sabian. This is, that's, it's like 30 years ago. But, but anyway, um, that's how I started my relationship with, with Sabian. Over the years, I've never played another symbol. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, as you know, the, the innovation, you know, from from the Sabian guys is is unmatched. You know, the quality of their symbols, you know, is unmatched because they basically don't break. Yeah. Like yeah. Some others that we know. <laughs> it's funny you mention that because I, I've been with the company for well over thirty years, and I have mm -hmm. never broken a Sabian symbol. And I'm traveling around the world, and I'm not kind to my symbols. I mean, I. <laughs> I play them to play them, so pretty powerful. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've been playing Evolution hi hats mm. probably for the last fifteen years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got another another hat that I like. If you can, if you guys can see that, the, the legacy, the legacy. Oh, yeah. again, out of the mind, yeah. out of the mind of Dave Weckl. This evolution and this legacy, you know, line came out of the mind of Dave Weckl, the, the brilliant mind of Weckl, to come up with this concept of what he was hearing. So those are yeah. beautiful symbols. Yeah, those are beautiful symbols. Um, uh, the more of the some of the later models that I that I have, which I really love, which I really kind of feel like express my musical sound, are the, it's the Artisan series. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So I've got, you know, uh, a 22. I don't have that. That symbol is actually those symbols are in Orlando right now. But uh, I've got uh, the, the 22 uh, ride. Um, I've got um, a 17 crash and 18. It's kind of like a ride crash. But those artisan symbols, I mean, they're so smooth. Oh, beautiful. You know, just. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful sounding symbols. Mm hmm. So, so you'll mix, you know, the artisan, you'll mix the legacy, you'll mix the evolution, you'll find out what you need for a certain gig. So, I mean, obviously it changes from, from gig to gig. Right. And here's, here's, here's one because I was just in Memphis yesterday. Oh. I don't know if you guys can, can see that, but this is a <laughs> Memphis ride. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Memphis, uh, down in Memphis is the Memphis Drum Shop. Jim Pettit, who owns the shop there, that's a great, great store. They do, you know, a fantastic supporting of symbols, you know, for Sabian, and they're just great, great people. But Memphis is, is guys, I'm sure you had some great food down there, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, some great barbecue. <laughs> Corky's barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So all these different symbols, you've got like a collection of symbols that you use for certain gigs. And, and, and you know, will, will you map out a certain series or a certain sound that you'll want for certain gigs? Absolutely. Yes. I, I also have, um, uh, it's a 20 inch sizzle B series the, from the vault. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful jazz ride. It's just so smooth. And, and, you know, the wash is just perfect. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, the, you know, they, you know, the, the guys at saving, they just know what they're doing. You know, yeah, with those they, hand, hand with the hand hand with you know lines and uh, yeah yeah they they're just they're just I can't say enough good things about them. I mean, it says it all in that I never played another symbol. <laughs> well, I mean that, that's the bottom line. And in the olden days, Nord Hargrove was there, mm -hmm. and 
was the one that would choose the symbols for us all. Now it's Mark Love. And mm -hmm. these guys are such seasoned pros yes. at the sounds that, you know, you describe the sound you're looking for and they go into the vault and they come out and they bring it and, and they'll bring five symbols of what you described and all of them sound great. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It'll sound what you hear in your head, so it becomes hard to decide. But, uh, well, yeah. that's fantastic. I'll tell you, Jonathan, you know, it's just so great to have this time with you and uh, to spend some time with you. You've been a dedicated Sabian player for years, a Sabian Education Network is this education network of these teachers, thousands mm -hmm. of teachers around the world. We've got people that have logged on from Indonesia, from Brazil, from upstate New York, from Iowa, from, my gosh, from Moscow, Artemy Corps from Moscow. <laughs> I mean, there are people that are literally all around the world that have joined us on here. That Boy, thank you all so much for, for, for joining us here. This is incredible to have this opportunity to have some shared Absolutely. ideas from you, Jonathan. Just fairly fantastic. Dom, thank you so much. I mean, I mean, thank, thank you, and 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 Joe also. Thanks, thank, thank both of you. You know, Joe Bergamini, who is a, a, is just a phenomenal player in his own right, and mm -hmm. uh, running the Sabian Education Network and manages this site and keeps it all going. And there's just such a, a great teamwork of people, from Joe Bergamini from the Sabian Education Network side, Christian mm -hmm. Stanky from Artist Relations, who understands every artist and what their needs are, yeah. and yeah. Christian. Very closely uh, involved, you know, personally with Neil Peart through all those years, and uh, mm -hmm. of course helped Neil for what he was doing, and just having this incredible relationship with these people in this company and someone like yourself who's out there playing, and even through this pandemic, you've been yeah. practicing and working out, and you've been keeping yourself in shape, and and you're still pushing yourself. So I look forward to at some point when you hit the road again, man. Let's get together for sure. Absolutely, De definitely, definitely. Keep me posted if you get to the New York area, for sure. We'll keep in touch. Jonathan, thank you so much. On behalf of the Saving Education Network, you have done fantastic. This is exciting. I want to get everybody pick up African-American Funk, Modern Drummer Publications. Track it down. You can find it everywhere online. You can find it digitally. Track down the book. Work on the ideas. And for sure, have fun as I'm having fun going through the book. So, <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much. Stay well. Stay safe. And thank we'll you, talk to you soon. Bless you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.